Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Gordon Mata Clark, an archival source book uh, edited by Wendolyn Owens and Philip Ursprung and published by University of California Press. Gordon Mata Clark has never been an easy artist to categorize or to explain. Few figures in the second half of the 20th century have made both the world of art and the world of architecture as uneasy as Gordon Mata Clark did. He studied architecture at Cornell University in the 1960s, and yet, because he did not use his training to build or to construct, he is rarely considered an architect. Instead, he used his training to unbuild or transform spaces, creating art by altering existing structures or environments. He is viewed as a sculptor, a photographer, an organizer of performances, a writer of manifestos. In the brief span of his career, from 1968 to his early death in 1978, he created an oeuvre that has made him a cult figure, whose art continues to inspire and be wilder. During his lifetime, Mata Clark's performative interventions in existing buildings such as Splitting 1974 and Canonical Intersect 1975 caused a sensation within a specific slice of the art world. Only a small group of friends, gallerists, critics and passerby saw the interventions in person or participated in the performances. But Mata Clark produced films, drawings, photographs and photographic collages that documented his work. Drawings and photographs were shown in galleries and museums and works were sold, although he was not broadly known by collectors and curators. The impact of his work on the broader arts community wouldn't truly be felt until after his death. Even now, his influence on art and architecture continues to deepen and expand. It was the circulating retrospective exhibitions, first in the groundbreaking show in Chicago 1985 curated by Mary Jane Jacob, and next in the show in Marseille 1993 curated by Corinne de Seren, that laid the groundwork for his posthumous fame. These exhibitions were widely seen and the catalogues of both shows set high standards. Viewers were able to get to know his work through the written documentation of his processes as well as through photographs and collages. In addition to these exhibitions, a growing number of scholarly studies have enriched our knowledge of Mata Clark. Since the millennium, scholars such as Pamela Lee, James Attlee, Thomas Crow, Mark Wigley, Francis Richard and many others depict Amata Clark who preferred setting processes in motion rather than leaving objects behind, an artist who oscillated between architectural and artistic practice and who produced collective urban performances whose character as works of art and indeed on occasion even whose authorship were intentionally left open and disordered. This at times chaotic artist was the Mata Clark who altered lofts, experimented with video while documenting every step and played language games that are manifested in hundreds of index cards. His art consists of an open series of fragments and all but cries out to be completed by each of its interpreters. Consequently, biography plays a central role in interpretation as his work is seen as an integral component of his life. Mata Clark's life story is indeed fascinating. One need only think of the apparent rivalry with his father, the surrealist painter Roberto Matta, whose brilliant career and lifestyle Mata Clark tried to outdo or his solicitous love for his twin brother, Sebastian, 1943-1976, also an artist, whose failure to conform to and cope with everyday life was a constant worry for the family. Upon discovering these biographical details, one can hardly resist the urge to use Mata Clark's life to explain his work. 
the more we find out, the more we become ensnared in the dense web of facts and fictions that link his person, his oeuvre and his reception. The unapologetic informality of his life as described in interviews along with the easy, friendly voice we discover in his letters leads many interpreters to refer to him by his first name. For this source book we have chosen not to follow the fashion of calling him simply Gordon, but instead to use the more formal Mata Clark. In his case, it is less the cult of the star or genius that serves as the basis of the interest in his person. Our desire to know more about his biographical details has to do with the performative structure of his work and the fact that his most influential work can only be interacted with indirectly, as it exists solely through film, photography or video of ephemeral events. Because it showcases a process more than a product, and because we are witness to the art only through its captured echoes, his body of work calls for additional clarification. This may explain why the voices of his contemporaries, more so than for some other artists of his generation, carry such great weight in interpreting his work. Indeed, the interviews that John, Simon and Richard Armstrong conducted with Mata Clark's comrades in arms only a few years after his death, which are published in the catalogue of the Retrospective in Chicago and in the Marseille Exhibition catalogue, still function as central sources for interpretation. In fact, their importance rivaled published statements by Mata Clark himself in establishing his status as an artist. A selection of the Simon interviews is included in this source book. Together, Mata Clark's writings and the statements of those who knew him and his work round our understanding. In 2002, Gordon Mata Clark's widow, Jane Crawford, put his archive on deposit at the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. It includes the archive of the artist's mother, Anne Clark Mata Alpert, which filled in much of the backstory of his childhood and, perhaps more importantly, included letters that he wrote to his mother while he was working as an artist. The arrival of the material was met with an overwhelming and almost instantaneous response. Suddenly, there was a new voice in the discussion of Mata Clark's work his own. Containing letters, statements, interviews, drawings, photographs and films, the CCA archive, as we will call it, offered new paths in Mata Clark's intriguing art practice. In 2011, the Gordon Mata Clark archive was formally donated to the CCA, thus CCA has become a permanent critical destination for those seeking a clear understanding of Mata Clark and his work. But, rather than regarding the CCA archive as neutral documentation and the key to the real Mata Clark, we need to accept that it is fragmentary documentation, an autobiography constructed by himself, his mother and his widow. It begs for interpretation while eluding hard facts. The Gordon Mata Clark revealed through these sources continues to subvert expectations. We learn through letters, for example, about important connections to well-known artists and architects made through Mata Clark's family, particularly his cosmopolitan artist father, and also through his training in architecture at Cornell University. He made use of these connections and then stopped, instead becoming part of the downtown New York scene, exhibiting in the new alternative galleries in Soho, both the artist-run and newer commercial galleries. Later, letters in the archive document that he became an incredible networker, not unlike his father, expanding and following up on new connections made through friends and colleagues rather than through his family. Overall, one discovers from reading Mata Clark's own writings an artist with a much more deliberate and serious purpose to his practice than we may have previously realized.
we meet someone with some type of inner compass driving him forward on a path that, seen from the outside, comes across as disorganized and almost random. He was a tireless worker, the CCA archive has letters showing that he was pursuing many more projects in many more places, such as in Houston and Los Angeles, than he ever was able to carry out. Because of the seemingly disorganized nature of his actual output, both in his artwork and his writings, it is tempting to interpret the artist as more mysterious than he actually was. This book aims to present, in chronological order, as best we can determine, what Mata Clark said about his own work. The idea is to bring his own voice back to the fore in order to demystify his art by demonstrating his thought processes. Not everything in the CCA archive is included in this source book, as this is not a complete catalogue and personal rather than professional material is omitted, although this can be hard to separate. Materials included in this volume from other sources add new information. Ultimately, our goal is not to provide the last word on Gordon Mata Clark, but to advance thinking about his work. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.